Now, segueing into tonight's session, the disappearance of the bees alerts us to a fundamental and systemic flaw in our approach to the use of toxic chemicals and highlights the question as to whether our risk assessment approaches to regulation will slowly but surely cause our demise without meaningful changes, of course. In the book, A Spring Without Bees, How Colony Collapse Disorder Has Endangered Our Food Supply, the author, Michael Shacker, identifies humans' anthropology anthropocentric worldview as justifying our manipulation of nature to the brink of destruction. The bees should serve as a warning because our very existence depends on theirs. The bee problem, which is not new but just more frightening than it's ever been before, should be a wake-up call. It should force us to rethink how we approach policies that allow the management of pests with a warlike mentality and continued use of chemicals for which there are safe alternatives. While admittedly certain, certain and filled with deficiencies, while admittedly, excuse me, uncertain and filled with deficiencies, risk assessments established unsupported thresholds of acceptable chem chemical contamination of ecosystems despite the availability of non-toxic practices and products. In fact, the only acceptable policies in this crisis this honeybee crisis and pollinator crisis are those that eliminate toxic chemical use. The only acceptable legislative reform proposals are those that eliminate unnecessary toxic chemical use. For example, why do we allow chemical intensive practices in agriculture when organic practices that eliminate the vast majority of hazardous substances are commercially viable? Risk assessments supported by environmental and public health statutes in effect prop up unnecessary poisoning. An unhealthy ecosystem adversely affects the health of all those living in it. So it comes as no surprise that people, along with other species, suffer environmental illness. So this is, the ecosystem certainly supports all life. It is not a far stretch to focus on environmental illness in humans. What makes this period of history, though, for me, and I hope for you, exciting, is that the choice is clear and the solutions are within our grasp. I didn't feel that way 20 and 30 years ago. 30 years ago, we, we couldn't point to a vibrant and profitable sector of organic agriculture. We couldn't point to structural pest control companies that, instead of exterminating with poisons, are preventive and practices that eliminate the conditions that encourage or invite pest problems. They weren't out there. We did not have the numbers of people, an apparent majority of the population, according to the polls I cited earlier, who know that sustainability is important, but may not yet know how they can and should affect that personal and political choices on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the framework, as I see it, for the conference. Um, I appreciate all the work that you all are doing um, in this room um, in, in very important and critical ways and welcome you again to the 29th National Pesticide Forum um, and this first panel of speakers. Thank you. So I'm going to segue here to the, the panel, which includes, um, as you can see in your program, uh, three speakers, uh, James Frazier uh, from Penn State and Tom Theobald from Colorado, Marigal. Meister from, uh, Meister from um, Colorado. And what I'll do is, um, I guess I'll introduce you all as you come up. So I'm going to invite Jim to come up here. Um, Jim uh, is a professor, of, a professor of entomology at Penn State University. He is um, a leading researcher, national research, on the disappearance of honeybees, known as colony collapse disorder a phenomenon in which worker bees from a beehive or honeybee colony um, abruptly disappear. His team is focusing on synergistic and sublethal effects of multiple pesticides on the chemical census and chemical mediated behaviors of honeybees in relation to honeybee health and CCD. Dr. Frazier is an expert in the field of chemical ecology. Um, his research is, uh, focuses on the structure and functioning of insect um, chemosensory uh, systems, chemosensory systems on chemically mediated behavior. And with that, please help me welcome uh, Dr. James Frazier.
Thank you, Jay. <clears throat> I appreciate the invitation to be here tonight, and I thank Beyond Pesticides for sponsoring this forum. Well, I especially would like to thank those of you who are here in the audience because it indicates that you have an interest in this subject, that you're willing to learn, and more importantly, willing to do something about it. In the next few minutes, I want to give you a snapshot of my experiences together with our team as we've tried to understand if pesticides really are playing a role in the declining health of honeybees. This is our current team uh, in, in the lab at Penn State. We have uh, two undergraduate students on the left who are also members of the Penn State women's uh, rugby team. Our, our technician, Sarah Ashcraft, uh, who's just a real dynamo. Uh, behind, behind here is Chris Mullen, our insect toxicologist. In front of him is uh, Tim Carlo, a new graduate student. My wife, Mary Ann, uh, is in this, next, to, next to him. She's the honeybee extension person in the state of Pennsylvania and has been for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm in the back, and next to me is Wan Yi Zhu, a really talented Chinese graduate student. So Mary Ann, Chris, and I formed this, what we call the, the pesticide team. Mary Ann with the, with the bee expertise, Chris as a toxicologist, and myself as a behavior physiologist. And it's really taken our three expertises together to try to understand what's going on. We uh, collaborate broadly with a number of people, but it's really uh, Roger Simmons and his team at the USDA National Science Lab that has the latest technology to do, analyze pesticides at the level of parts per billion. That's been key to our pesticide study. We collaborate with a number of other people in the Center for Pollinator Research at Penn State, um, uh, the large CAPS-funded USDA project that has 14 different universities represented in it, uh, the USDA Carl Hayden Bee Lab in Tucson. Uh, we have colleagues in the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi. We're also studying African bees. And finally, the National Honey Bee Advisory Board that I'm a science advisor for. I'm sure you all know honeybees are really important because of their pollination. More than 90 crops estimated that one out of every three bites of food that we take is a result of this pollination, currently valued in the U.S. system at somewhere near $15 billion. A lot of the things that we like to eat are almost entirely dependent on honeybees for pollination, but there are some that are dependent on other pollinators. Some of the, some of the 3,500 species of native bees in the eastern United States that participate in this. Colony collapse disorder was first brought to our attention by Dave Hackenberg, who's one of the large migratory beekeepers from Pennsylvania who overwinters his bees in Florida. And he came to us early in uh, 2007 and said, something's wrong with my bees. I don't know what it is. I don't think it's my beekeeping. Can you help me? And that got, got us started down this path of trying to investigate colony collapse disorder. Um, in 2007, the first uh, initial survey indicated that about a third of the U.S. colonies across the United States were disappearing, and that number has remained little changed in the intervening years. The only, the only reason that beekeeping is still viable is that the, the beekeepers are, have dedicated their lives and their resources to actively trying to replace that one-third of the lost bees that happens each year. About the same time, the National Academy of Sciences had commissioned a study to look at North American pollinators, and lo and behold, the study came out saying that the status of pollinators in North America is that they're declining. All pollinators, not just insect pollinators, but other pollinators as well, for unknown reasons. Uh, near that same time, a study in Science 2006 talks about parallel declines in pollinators in, in uh, England and in the Netherlands, along with the insect pollinated plants that depend on it, on those insects for pollination are also collapsing. So in fact, there's a real ecosystem catastrophe beginning to happen. Well, colony collapse disorder, as Jay mentioned, is, is characterized by having an adult bee population that suddenly is gone. They're not in the hive anymore, they've disappeared. There's a lot of brood that's available with only a small cluster of bees on that uh, section of brood with the queen intact, and uh, the colony is not really viable at that point. So it can happen in a matter of weeks, or it can happen in a matter of a few days. Well, honeybees are exposed to pesticides in lots of different ways in the environment. Through the flowers, agricultural system flowers that they contact, through other agricultural systems that we don't really expect them to be on, such as corn, uh, through beekeeper-applied chemicals for the control of varroa mites and, and tracheal mites that have been really, uh, have changed beekeeping in the United States for the last 20, 25 years, and finally through the water that they drink. 
Well, I know how many of you have read the book, The Wisdom of the High, by Tom Seeley, but it is an absolute gem, and if you're really interested in bees, I would encourage you to read this book. Dr. Seeley is one of the truly gifted honeybee researchers uh, in the country. This is a, a slide taken from his book where he talks about he's one of the people who's actually measured what honeybees colonies are doing when they're out actively foraging in the field. And he said they spend 95% of their time foraging within a radius of about six kilometers, which is three and three quarter miles. That turns out to be a, an area of 28,000 acres. Under times of stress, that is if food is short, they will go up to 10 kilometers. That's an area of 78,500 acres. And they can do this in terms of finding the most nutritious, rewarding source of nectar within a two hour time period. So if flowers are blooming, coming into bloom in a given day, within that 78,000 acres, those bees may, may be really well at finding it. And so a colony is a very dynamic thing. They, are, they have evolved to collect multiple kinds of pollen in a very re, sometimes resource limited or unpredictable resource environment. And so they are really good at getting the job done. Well, we got involved in, uh, when, when CCD first broke, there was a, an emergency team put together. They got some emergency funding to go out and sample uh, as many places across the United States where colonies were disappearing. And they were sampling for all sorts of reasons. We had no idea what the cause was at this point in time. And s sampling for pollen was part of what was done, but it wasn't really done in uh, the most systematic way. We since got involved in some other studies and gathered pollen from those uh, studies as well. That's been a part of uh, more than 900 samples that we've analyzed. Pesticides are certainly present in, in honeybee colonies. They're present in the wax. Uh, a lot of pesticides that are lipid soluble will preferentially dissolve in the wax and stay there for a half-life of five years or more. Uh, they're in the pollen that bees are gathering. They're in the foundation on which the, uh, uh, the wax is, is built. We actually analyzed the foundation supplied by the five major manufacturers of, of foundations for beekeeping equipment and found all the sources contaminated. And then as the pollen is manufactured into brood food, uh, that's fed to the brood. So all of these are potential sources of, of contamination in the colon, colony. Uh, with today's sophisticated uh, analytical equipment, we can analyze for parts per billion in the former generation, it was parts per million. It takes very, sophistic very sophisticated equipment to do this. There are very few places in the United States where one can get these kinds of analytical samples run. And I like to uh, try to use uh, an example of what is a part per billion, something that you might be able to remember, something fairly close to home. Well, if you had a roll of toilet paper that you could stretch from New York to London, that would be a billion sheets. And so one part per billion would be one sheet of that roll stretching from New York to London. So it's not a large number, okay? But because of the biological activity of these things, that doesn't mean we can discount them. There's lots of ways to express that. Well, we found in looking at our samples that when we looked at pesticide detections in wax gathered from these U.S. Uh, beehives, that 100% contained the two major miticides that had been used, cumafos and fluvalinate, uh, at levels that were astounding um, in terms of their uh, quantity. Chlorpyrifos is a widely used organophosphate. That was there in, in nearly 75% of the hives. And chlorthalonil, one of the most widely used fungicides, was there at, in a third of the colonies to begin with. That number grew as, we went, as time went on. Um, <clears throat> Very few of the 887 samples that we looked at in our initial study lacked any detection. That is, there were pesticides in nearly every sample. We found 121 different pesticides and metabolites. All the major cla ca classes of chemicals are represented. Pyrethroids, organophosphates, carbamates, neonicotinoids, insect growth regulators, organochlorines, chlorinated cyclodienes. Some of the organochlorines are materials that have been banned for many years. This was in all hives, yeah. Uh, fungicides, herbicides, acaricides, one synergist. At least 14 of these were systemic pesticides. An average of 6.7 different pesticides per pollen sample, with one sample containing as many as 31 compounds. 
We were blown away. So have been most people when they hear this for the first time. Here's the list of things that we found. Honeybees are really excellent indicators of the environmental quality. They're gathering pollen that has a pesticide load that is difficult for us to handle. I'm not sure how well the bees are doing either. So in an early article uh, in uh, Beekeeping Magazine, we put this diagram to try to depict that from the outside, as the bees are gathering pollen and nectar, they're bringing in potentially all the major classes of agricultural chemicals that are being used. Uh, inside the hive, the beekeepers have been trying to fight mites with, uh, with uh, two kinds of major chemicals, fluvalinate and cumafos. All of these are accumulating inside the colony. And what are the consequences of this for colony health? Well, there are certainly, if there's an average of 6.7 chemicals per uh, sample of pollen, there's the p potential for huge pesticide interactions. And what makes this the beginning of the story, sort of at round two, in the old days, when pesticides were highly toxic, you could count on knowing what happened because you'd have a pile of dead bees outside the colony. But the Food Quality Protection Act has driven companies to make chemicals that are greater, have greater safety for humans. So as a consequence, these new generations of chemicals are safer for us, but not necessarily safer for bees or for the environment. And the world of sublethal effects is where we're trying to understand the multiplicity of interactions that are going on and then the potential for interacting with other stressors. Well, here's one of the amazing things. We understand the pesticides that act on the nervous system can disrupt the nervous system and eventually kill the insect. We know that they have a specific molecular target site that the chemical binds to. But we have no idea what the distribution of that chemical binding site is throughout the nervous system. So actually, the actual cause of death for a poisoning of an insect through the nervous system is unknown. This means that if we use a dose that's less than enough to kill outright, the manifestations of that can be many and varied. And in fact, the list is almost endless. Let's use the neonicotinoids as an example. Uh, the neonicotinoids are a class of compounds that mimic nicotine, and nicotine was the first poison found to bind to the acetylcholine receptor. So there's a subclass of receptors at the in insect synapse called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Just recently, honeybees uh, have been found to have six genes for this receptor that are un unique to honeybees. Well, if these receptors are distributed among neurons in different ways, nerve cells that process learning, if that's the site of action, then all potential learned behaviors could be disrupted. If it's nerve cells processing sensory information, then all other kinds of behavior. If it's pheromone-mediated behavior, then those things could be disrupted and on down the road. So the number of possibilities is really large. And depending upon the kind of neonicotinoid we're talking about, the uh, toxicity and its mode of action can be quite varied. Well, honeybees have this social organization. That is, they're, they're described as a superorganism because they cooperate, and there's a lot of regu regulation of behavior and, and uh, regulatory pathways at the colony level as well as individual level changes. And so a pesticide can be toxic on the individual or it can be toxic at the level of disrupting behavior and coordination at the colony level. Currently work in our lab is looking at sublethal impacts of pesticides on honeybees in a number of different ways. We're looking at the effects on workers, <clears throat> the effect on larval development, on, on behavioral effects, on physiological effects, and finally we're doing some simulation modeling to try to put this all together. Here's one example using two commercial uh, compounds of sale and NOVA as the fungicide at doses at which either one of these will do nothing. When they're combined, you can get as much as 80% mortality. One of the major components of the formulation of systemic insecticides is N-methylperolidone. At 1% in the diet, this is benign to adult honeybees. But at 1 one-hundredth of a percent when fed to larvae, it kills 50% of the larvae in four days. We looked at pollen that's stored inside the colony, and the trapped pollen as it's coming in shows the level of materials on the left, and on the right-hand side is the uh, concentration of materials in bee bread. And so storing things in contaminated wax will add chemicals to the bee bread. 
we observed and heard from the beekeepers that a lot of them are observing what's called entombing behavior where, where cells filled with, with uh, contaminated pollen are capped over with uh, propolis. We found that in those uh, capped over cells, there were very high levels of some of the pesticides, and it suggests that this entombing behavior may be a behavioral mechanism for walling off and preventing the use of contaminated pollen. We've had a study that was done with CCD where we used essentially an epidemiological study, assuming that this is an unknown phenomenon and what are the potential things that might be causing it. We looked at 55 different potential explanatory variables. Six of those with the greatest predicting power turned out to be pesticide levels. And the top component of that was Kumafos level, was the most discriminating variable, and it was associated with healthy colonies. Seems to be counterintuitive, and yet if Kumafos is inducing the resistance mechanisms inside the bees from being exposed to it all the time, then this could be important in mitigating sublethal impacts if pesticides are really the culprit. A new study just out from our colleagues at Penn State has shown that RNA viruses are carried on pollen grains from contaminated bees to flowers, and uncontaminated other species of bees arriving at those flowers will pick up that contaminated pollen and take it back to their colony or to their home, whatever it is. We have early indications that pesticides may also be exchanged at flowers through contaminated pollen, but more work is needed. So that's what happens in a managed colony of honeybees may be critical for the survival of a wild poll pollinator community and has impacts far beyond what we have thought so far. One of the things that's unknown about pesticides is what happens as it's stored as bee bread. There's a real microbial community inside of bee bread that, that fosters lots of chemical reactions. Uh, the group at the USDA Bee Lab in, in uh, Tucson is looking at the effects of fungicides. They're into this. They found some really interesting things. Uh, if you culture um, the microbial community from bee bread and apply fungicides to that, it will inhibit the growth of a number of those organisms, suggesting that a pesticide contaminated pollen is disrupting what happens to bee bread. They've also seen the uh, interference with the ability to requeen the colony. So what have we learned about pesticides? Well, we've indicated that there's lots of pesticides in pollen but we re and wax, but we really have not identified the problem. This was not a systematic survey. It's not done in a, in a way that really is representative, that tells us what's representative of what's happening in different agricultural systems, and there's no plans to do that. There is no toxicological literature about the effects of combinations of herbicides, fungicides, insecticides added together. We're the first trying to unravel that. We're as concerned about the adjuvants and the formulation ingredients as we are about the active ingredients. What we know about the sublethal effects of pesticides is probably more important than what we do know. The fact that there's this tremendous long list for each kind of pesticide that we simply know nothing about really, really makes the precautionary principle an important idea. And I, I know from the research that's underway right now that in the next year we're going to see a lot of studies telling us about the impacts of pesticides at the sublethal level on honeybees and other pollinators. From a broader perspective, I'd say the current decline of pollinators and plant communities in England and the Netherlands is indicative of early ecosystem collapse, the exact antithesis of sustainability. While the current pesticide registration process in the United States that has allowed the current insecticides and fungicides that we use to be registered without significantly addressing honeybee safety, and the people at EPA will admit this, changes are underway. And that's the bright spot. But this only helps for future registrations. There's not a good way of going back and redoing things that have already been registered. It's certainly not in the timely manner that's necessary. The precautionary principle is alive and well in guiding governmental and environmental policy in lots of countries, but unfortunately not here. Those of us who are favor favorable to organic farming and sustainability are living by that principle on a daily basis perhaps it's time to ensure that our government does the same thing. While pollinator decline is an immediate crisis that threatens our food security, solving it is not a national priority. It's almost enough to give you nightmares. If it does, perhaps I've done my job. Thanks for listening.
Thank you so much, Jim. It's a great way to kick us off. Um, obviously, we all operate from science. A science-based um, approach to advocacy is, I think, why we've had some of the successes we've had and I think why we'll have success in the future. Um, Tom bridges the world of the practical beekeeper uh, to the policymaker, to the scientist, and has done extraordinary work, I think, in terms of uh, writing uh, his thoughts and connecting the dots uh, over the last several years uh, associated with colony collapse and adverse impacts on bee populations associated with uh, the constellation of issues that we face when we look at this question. His background is in the field for 35 years. He is the owner and operator of Niwot Honey Farm, which is here in Niwot, Colorado. And he has is, is one of the founders of the Boulder County Beekeepers Association, which um, has, and he's been its president for 30 years. So obviously, Tom is engaged in working with other beekeepers that, that I've learned about firsthand. Um, and Tom was actually a, also a, uh, the last county inspector in the state of Colorado, um, the last county bee inspector. Uh, that office, which was established in 1891, was, as I understand, discontinued in 2000. So Tom comes to us with incredible experience and insight and with the um, knowledge that uh, he has brought to us what is known as the leaked memo from EPA, and they'll tell us all about that, that identified the underlying data supporting the registration of some of these, one pesticide in particular, but one of a family of pesticides, um, that is associated with uh, adverse impacts on colony health. So, Tom, thanks again for being here, and we appreciate all the work that you've been doing. Well, hello. <clears throat> it's encouraging to see some faces of friends in the audience. Uh, when the moment of truth arrives, I always wonder how I've gotten myself into this position because I was always a shy boy, and although my friends won't believe it, I'm still shy, and yet here I am. I want to thank Jim for giving us the background against which we work. I'd like to bring this down to the beekeeper level. As Jay said, I've been a beekeeper for 35 years, and I've dealt with pesticides for that entire time. It was the reason that we formed the Boulder County Beekeepers Association in the beginning, to give a single voice to deal with the applicators. Um, I've been experiencing these losses much longer than it's been on the national scene. I first identified the varroa mites in Boulder County in 1995. Historically, an operation like mine would experience winter losses of 2 to 5 percent. Those climbed to 20 percent, 30 percent. During the first few years, we began to get the varroa mite under control but the losses continued to escalate. Several weeks ago, I had a nightmare. Like every practicing beekeeper, I'm wrestling with the cause of these problems. Why are we having these continuing high losses? And in my nightmare, I envisioned a, a family of pesticides that were per pervasive, pernicious, and persistent, which were water-soluble, which got into the vascular system of the plants and were expressed in the pollen and the nectar, which migrated with the groundwater, which would poison the soil for decades. In some cases, it takes a hundred years for the soil to purge itself of these chemicals in my nightmare. And then I awoke, and I realized that it wasn't a nightmare at all, that it's reality. It's what we're confronted with. Now, Jim quoted the figure of a third of the bees being lost each year. 
I'm in contact with uh, many of the commercial beekeepers, and they're reluctant to tell you just how many bees they've lost, because in many cases they feel that it's a reflection on their ability as beekeepers. So they tend to be conservative. And the figures that that one-third loss is based on are primarily winter losses. They fail to account for the losses that take place during the rest of the year. And it's my observation in communication with my commercial beekeeping friends that we're dealing with annual losses more on the order of 50% or more. No business can sustain that sort of loss to its base year after year and stay in business. And the only reason that we're still here is because beekeepers are like family farmers and ranchers. They will work themselves to death to keep their operations going, and they have done that. We are just about at the end of our rope. I've been a beekeeper for 35 years. This will be year number 36. This may very well be my last year as a production beekeeper. We're faced with environmental problems that we cannot live with. We have to have change. We have to have change soon. And that change has to come from you. In my nightmare, we were deserted by the major media outlets. The only stories that we've seen in the major media are where there's an opportunity to spin this story away from pesticides. In my nightmare, we were deserted by the regulatory agencies, who rather than support us, have become our adversaries, who endorse bad science and hide from good science. This cannot continue. And the an only answer to that is those people who are in this room and people like you. Because the media isn't going to help us. Congress has failed at every step of the way to take any leadership in this issue. The EPA wants to sweep these problems under the rug because to admit to any of this is an admission of failure. And we certainly can't rely on the chemical companies to act responsibly. So I'm not going to take a lot of time whining about what's happening, but these are serious, serious environmental problems. And as you will see over the next day, the bees really are just the indicator species. This goes far beyond the bees. We're observing environmental damage of enormous proportions and we need your help. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I guess we'll hear about the leaked EPA memo later. Come to tomorrow in the workshop. That's, what, uh, that's where we're going to hear about the details on the leaked memo. Um, I wanted to now introduce... Um, Mary Gail Meister, because Mary Gail, in addition to being a backyard beekeeper, um, is the reason we're here in Colorado, because she uh, called the office <laughs> and said, why don't you bring the Beyond Pesticides Conference to Denver? And we said, why should we? <laughs> and she gave us a long list of good reasons, and um, here we are. But I think Mary Gale really um, embodies sort of what we, as I guess all of us in this room, believe is necessary to make change in this country. When you identify a problem, you go out and solve it, and you don't get beaten down by the threat of being jailed, as she was, <laughs> um, or having her bee hives taken away or, and being fined, uh, but you look at that challenge and you meet that challenge and you go to your local elected officials and you organize your peers and your friends and networks of organizations and you build the momentum to have that local 
city ordinance overturned, which is exactly what Mary Gail did uh, when uh, she faced these threats. So we should give her a warm welcome and round of applause because uh, she's done incredible work and continues to. Mary Gail. to stay I stand humble before you uh, I'm beekeeping in the very house that my grandfather built and where he taught me to beekeep as a small child and as we schlepped around beekeep equipment he always said to me will you ever get this and um, <laughs> so I don't know <laughs> where he might be now but um, I don't think he ever envisioned me being quite here um, it it was um, it was quite a um, it was quite a task uh, we put the bees in, and it seems simple undertaking. And then, of course, uh, the reality of the ordinances and permits and such uh, came to pass. But we did get it passed, and it certainly wasn't just by me, but it was a lot of a concerted effort from a group of a lot of dedicated people. Um, but then after that, we realized what we had facing us, keeping those bees in our backyards. Most people just keep one or two bees. Uh, beehives, whether it be Langstroth or or the um, the top bar, but we realized that we had a huge issue as far as pesticides. And you have a home, and you keep it safe, and you have an idea of what is safe, be it in your home or in your yard, with children and dogs. But you put a hive or two, and it has 80,000 bees in each of them, and you realize that you can't protect them. You can protect your yard, but you can't protect them. And so we've, we've gone to the city of Denver, and that's been an arduous task, and, and we've uh, laid out the information, certainly by Dr. Frazier and, and with the help of Mr. Theobald, uh, of what they're spraying. And it's not just simply the bee. It's the tropic dynamic of all of those, those um, primary consumers and how that is affecting everyone since we are a plant-based planet. We need those plants, whether it's for our atmosphere, the food, the clothing, even our medications. Uh, we definitely need our plants, and, and those pollinators is how those are perpetuated. So we've gone to the city. Um, we certainly encourage in our bee club. We started a bee club in Denver a couple of years ago, and it's grown to about 200 people. And we certainly encourage, and we practice uh, the use of, of uh, non-use of chemicals or medications. Uh, we've eliminated the foundation in most of our hives, and we really uh, stand by Brother Adam and that we recycle everything probably about starting at every three years, we realize that we might not be able to have an impact uh, readily on what's being sprayed in our communities, but we can eliminate as many variables as possible. And so we encourage, um, like I said, the elimination of any kind of chemicals within our own hives, uh, recycling out of equipment. Um, we're kind of guerrilla um, seed throwers. We throw lots of seeds around. We have a community that supports our beekeeping. We have a group uh, within that, we find people that uh, we resonate with, that we continue that. Denver just started its own bee apiary. Um, it's kind of out of Denver, but just about a mile. So more hands-on. You might not be interested in beekeeping up close, but you can certainly watch it happen. And we certainly hope that brings about more mindful and conscientious practices within, within um, people's own homes. And we certainly have, have looked into what parks are and hopefully there will be a paradigm shift and that they're not just huge sponges for chemicals. You have children and you have dogs, which you heard about from Caroline. Uh, they're taking many chemicals home. I spent many years as a bench chemist um, in pharmaceutical and in research, and so I know the effects, the lingering effects of most of those chemicals. So um, if you live in a community, support your bee community. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. We're gonna, we have time for a uh, question and answer. One of the things we noticed today as we were visiting local farms and gardens in the city, school gardens and community gardens, um, is that every site we were at um, is installing uh, beehives. So that's really encouraging and really, I think, the kind of thing we'd like to see happen around the country. I think it, it, it raises the ele it elevates this issue to a community awareness that needs to occur. So why don't we open this up to um, 
questions. Uh, and then, again, we will continue this discussion in the workshop tomorrow morning. Tomorrow. Um, Dr. Frazier, in your studies, how much of the pesticide was getting into the actual food product, the honey, and how is that trans transmuted to people? Uh, very good question. Uh, the, uh, actually, the laboratory that has done our pesticide analysis is a laboratory that does the, the market basket survey for the USDA, and uh, honey has never been a part of that commodity testing until our results came out. And since then, they've tested something like 2,000 samples of, of honey. And um, I think there was only one example, one, one source of honey that was beyond uh, suggested limitations. Everything else has, has been safe. So even though a lot, a lot of the pesticides are not water-soluble, the neonicotinoids are. And so fortunately, they're not going to partition into the honey as well as they do into the wax or into the bees themselves. So honey is, is quite safe by the standards that, and the testing that's been done. Yes. Uh, Dr. Frazier, which came first, the loss of the pollinators or the loss of the pollinated plants? Uh, the loss of the pollinators. Um, we spent uh, 2003 on a year sabbatical in England. Uh, lived in the city of Canterbury in southern England and had uh, a wonderful English garden in our, in our backyard. And so we were really excited about seeing the insects and having the insects there. We saw a bumblebee. We started looking in this. We found out that almost all the species of bumblebees in England have disappeared. Uh, there are about, I don't know, an exact number, but a handful that are, that are surviving in one small space in the southern part of England. People do not have window screens on their windows because at night with the lights on, there are no insects flying in the windows. Very, a very interesting scenario. Uh, Dr. Fraser, uh this is Greg Marsh, and I'm a forensic chemist, and I started my career in the 60s working for the forerunner of EPA, establishing stream standards based on biological effects that are used in the Clean Water Act. What it looks like to me is going on here. Uh, your, your data showing all the pesticides you've found is just colossal. The answer could very well be that you've got a second thing going on here, that you've yet to discover, of course, and that, that's kind of cut and dried at this point, I think. What it could be is, and you'll get the answer from analyzing pre-pesticide B products, and you look at them for living entities that can be killed by pesticides that provide protection to the bees. Thank you. Have these studies extended to wild bee populations, or are they basically studying captive bee populations? Uh, we have a new uh, three-year grant to look at uh, the impacts on native pollinator communities and apple orchards in Pennsylvania as a model for the East Coast uh, tree fruit industry. And over the next three years, we're going to be concentrating on uh, native species. We're going to be uh, looking to document the transfer of pesticides uh, by pollen from managed bee colonies to native species and the impacts of those uh, pesticides on native species. And there's similar studies going on other places in the country. I'd like to know about the EPA leak, the study, even though there's a workshop tomorrow. <laughs> it's been characterized as a leak. I wrote an article in Bee Culture magazine about my concerns and about my concerns about the life cycle study that was used to qualify one of the neonicotinoids, clothianidin, for registration. And 
we can talk about it in more detail tomorrow, but it really was a, a very faulty study. And, and I raised those questions in my article. And at least in part because of my article, when Bayer, the owner of the patent on the neonicotinoids, came to the EPA for registration of uh, clothianidin on mustard and cotton seed, the EPA scientists went back to the life cycle study, which had been assessed by the EPA originally as scientifically sound, and they concluded that it was not sound science. In, in November, just before Thanksgiving, I received a call from a person at EPA headquarters who said, Tom, you should be the first to know, and went on to explain that the scientists had downgraded this study. And that's what's been referred to as the leaked memo. I'm not sure that leaked memo is the proper terminology because really this was a public document and should have been available to any citizen. I asked if it had been documented. This person said, yes, it had, and I asked for a copy, and I received that, and that was the beginning of what we see unfolding over the past few months. And that study is available for any of you who would like to see the study, the leaked memo, the EPA documentation, all of that is available for your review on the Boulder County Beekeepers website. We've put as much of the information as possible on that website so that you can form your own conclusions. And that website is bouldercountybeekeepers.org. And I would encourage you to do that if you haven't already done so. I have a question. What, what, let me just follow up on that, if you don't mind. Um, one of the things you discovered, Tom, in, in looking at this issue over time was that the chemical in question, clothanidin, had been conditionally registered by EPA. Um, this is uh, a, a, an institutional problem, and it would be, I think, helpful to folks uh, if you were to explain what your finding was in that respect. Well, in 2003, the EPA scientists recommended that clothianidin not be registered until the life cycle study was completed. But their recommendation was overridden by EPA management, and clothianidin was given a conditional registration, the condition being the completion of this life cycle study during the first growing season. It was not completed for four years. It was a year and a half after that before the EPA finally evaluated it and determined it to be sound science. Now, the key is here of 94 pesticides, active pesticide ingredients that have been released to the market since 1997, 70% of them have been released under conditional registrations, which means if I were to come to you and say, here, drink this, we'll see what it does to you. That's basically what's being done. These chemicals are coming onto the market with enormous questions as to their safety unanswered. And what's happened is, rather than protecting the people in the environment, which is the EPA's basic charge, they've turned the environment into the experiment, and we've all become the experimental subjects. This has to stop. The state of California did the same thing with the light brown apple moth, and they sprayed it on people, and the people got sick. I have a question for Dr. Fraser. Uh, when you do the studies on the um, bees, are you going to also look at the pollen from genetically modified plants? Uh, no, we don't, we don't have any plans to do that. It's, it's not on our funded projects, and so although we're interested in that, it's just beyond our means to do it. Okay, okay, Tom, I have one more uh, question. This is about the email you sent, up, sent out with the uh, guy that had the farmer that had bees and they sprayed the Roundup next door and it killed all his bees. Could you touch on that? Uh, I explain a little bit. I'm not sure what, 
um, th- how the roundup affected the other beekeepers' bees? And you sent you're that. Talking about Terry Ingram in Illinois. Correct. Terry Ingram is a beekeeper of long experience, and he publishes the Small Beekeepers Journal. Terry is concerned because he believes that Roundup is affecting his bees negatively. It's causing his queens to die and become infertile, and it's affecting the viability of his colonies. He's tried repeatedly to get scientific interest in this question, and as of the last time I talked to him, nobody has followed up on this. So Roundup is an open question. We were talking on the way over. One of the more recent revelations is that we've created a class of super weeds which are resistant to Roundup. Roundup was brought onto the market and that was supposed to be a partial answer to the drenching of chemicals that farmers had had to use. Roundup was going to eliminate many of those chemical applications. And now what we see after only a few years of use is a creation of a class of super weeds. And the answer to that, it's now Dow's opportunity to step to the fore. And Dow has engineered, genetically engineered, corn, soybeans, and cotton to be resistant not only to Roundup, but to 2,4-D. So now, and 2,4-D is one half of what was called during the Vietnam War Agent Orange. So now we have the potential of millions of acres of American farmland being drenched with another chemical. And Jim may have more information on this. I just saw this recently, just within the last few days. Dow is trying to bring this genetically engineered product forward. This is their answer. Take the farmers even further down the poison path to oblivion. Well, I I can tell you that uh, Roundup uh, glyphosate is not active without the materials in the formulation. And so that's one of the reasons why we're so concerned about the other components in the formulation. This N-methylperolidone that I mentioned to you, we've seen recent products marketed where 60% of the material is N-methylperolidone. It's only one of many compounds that we really don't know much about. Thank you. Um, Mary Gell, I had a question for you. Um, You're teaching a class at the Denver Botanic Garden, and I assume that's pretty well attended. Yeah. Um, what what is your advice to communities in terms of developing awareness on this issue and encouraging um, communities and people to advance uh, local beekeeping or backyard beekeeping? Encouraging beekeeping or the reduction of pesticides? Well, beekeeping. And then, I mean, I guess I'm making the assumption here that uh, – there, once you get into beekeeping, you realize or recognize pretty quickly that bees are adversely affected by a whole, a whole series of events, including pesticide exposure. And so my assumption in this is that that's a part of what you teach, you know, when you're teaching at the Botanic Garden, and that we, we develop a whole other level of advocates for pesticide reduction, alternatives, organic practices, as people become closer to the bees and an understanding of uh, how important their survival is? Um, I think for us in Denver, what we've done is we've just gone directly to our city council members. And through the city council member, we've initiated meetings with Parks and Recs and the Department of Health. And as I mentioned earlier, it's been an arduous task. Who's ever heading the Department and Recs and Department of Health? Um, They have not been eager to... Um, explain their IPM program, which then meant to me that they probably didn't have an IPM program. And the only question that I went in with them to ask was, at what point do you use hard chemicals? And they didn't really have an answer. So that's the ledge we're on right now, and we're regrouping. But what's great about having an actual beekeeping group and having an ordinance passed that allows for beekeeping is that we're just having a bigger voice, and it's growing, and it's becoming exponential. 
Um, beekeepers are also, you know, parents and they're pet owners. And so if you are beekeeping or you're attempting to get that passed, I mean, there's certainly precedences that have been set in large urban city, cities uh, that have beekeeping, uh, successful beekeeping, people who are cognizant um, of issues around beekeeping, swarming, what have you. Um, but it just takes... It just takes going to the city officials and just keep um, chinking the armor um, for them to reduce it. Um, I think that we can have lots of meetings and can do that to that sort of gathering, but it's just going to the city officials, finding the one who's um, eager or who's open to listening, and then just working your way in. Uh, that's what we've done. Um, certainly, I think the best way to pass beekeeping ordinances is to have examples in your community and, uh, municipalities that do have ordinances and they're successful and certainly when we got the ordinance passed in Denver they didn't ask for permits they didn't ask for registrations or inspections and so we have made a point every month to have speakers that are either published or in research to show a track record that we have been there for beekeepers in the larger community certainly not just Denver uh, that they can come and learn um, and it's not something that's simply you know passed down through generations but it's cutting edge um, research and publications. And that's what we're doing. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Are there any last questions for the panel? Yep. Um, just as a very beginning beekeeper and a um, environmentalist living in a big city like Denver, I really like your um, doorknob hanger, and I would like to get some more because I'd like to do some grassroots work in my neighborhood. And what would be very helpful is a list of alternatives, like corn gluten and stuff like that. Is that available anywhere? Yes. And can I get my hands on a bunch of these? Yes. In fact, we have in the audience, could you stand up, Chip Osborne with Osborne Organics, who's <laughs> A board member beyond pesticides sitting right next to you there. Um, <laughs> uh, he'll be doing a workshop on land management with other folks tomorrow, and we'll talk exactly on that topic. Sweet. But, you know, there are a number of websites out there that address this, including beyondpesticides.org. Okay. Is there another question? Of if the bees went somewhere else, they're not dead? <laughs> uh, Not in my dream. Because <laughs> no one found them all dead. Is there? I was just wondering if there are any theories that they all went somewhere else, like Nebraska. <laughs> no, no one's reported a large number of bees arriving in any particular place. And is there any way to GPS a hive or individual bees to track their? Yes. Uh, there, there is now the ability to put a, a, a radio frequency tag on individual bees and have um, uh, a detector on the colony entrance that will automatically count when that bee leaves and when it comes back and do that for ever, however many hundreds of bees you have RFID tagged. So it's a new research tool that's being used to uh, document disruption of colony dynamics um, by something like pesticides. Thank you all very much. Appreciate all your presentations and work, and we look forward to the workshop tomorrow. Thank you, panelists.